this talk is, is kind of targeted at people that have some knowledge of what an observable is, at, at the very least. Um, how many people here have used observables, have heard of observables? Fantastic. I feel like I'm doing my job. Um, so I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to get into how to think reactively uh, and, and deal with these things in, in Rx because uh, thinking reactively is, is kind of a mind-bending thing when we're used to imperative programming like we are with JavaScript. So um, are you new to RxJS? Are you, do you feel lost, helpless, alone when you're dealing with it? We've got hands raised back there. Um, <laughs> I'm Ben Lesh. I'm, uh, I'm actually the lead on RxJS 5, which is a redevelopment of RxJS from the ground up uh, that we've been working on at Netflix in collaboration with Google and Microsoft. Uh, I'm also a senior engineer at Netflix uh, working on the UI platform team, so things like Falcor I'm getting into right now. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Ben Lesh. So how long have uh, people here have raised their hands that they know what RxJS is? How many people here are actually using it? How, how long have you been using it? Have you been using it for one month? A little more than a month? A few people? Using it in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Playing with it. Yeah, that's all I do with it. I just play with it. Uh, six months? All right, all right. A year? Still got people going. Two years? Wow, more than five years. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, you, you've, got, you've got me beat. Uh, but it's, uh, it's close enough, it's close enough. So I, uh, I've, been, I've been involved for uh, maybe a little more than two years uh, with RxJS, actually even using it. Um, RxJS is more than nine years old. It was created by Matt uh, Padwasecki as part of Microsoft's Project Volta. So Microsoft's Project Volta was this crazy project where they're like, we're going to make C Sharp compile to JavaScript. And so they needed a compilation target for Rx.net. So it's a, the original was like a straight port of that. Um, so I've, I've been working on this a lot. I get a lot of questions about Rx. And here's questions I've been asked. Uh, what the hell is this, another Lodash? <laughs> uh, well, this is actually, no, I actually I asked this question myself the first time I saw it. This, that's totally true. I looked at it and I'm like, what is this, another Lodash? Um, what operator do I use? for that. Uh, I, I was frequently confused when I first started using Rx, like, oh, there's all these operators. What do I do? Um, how do I do this the Rx way? Uh, so I, I've worked in Angular 1 in the past, and there was like the Angular way. And so I, I try to think, well, I want to do this whatever way. I want to adopt the, the mentality of people that use this, this framework or this library all the time. And I didn't know what to do. Why did that observable die? That's a, that's a question I ask every now and then, even today. I'll be working with observables, and, and uh, you know, an error happened. I'll have a catch in there. I don't know why my observable stopped working after that. Um, and then, of course, there's the, what, what is this Rx code doing that I wrote four months ago? I have no idea. That <laughs> um, happens even, even now. So I can answer a few of these. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is thinking reactively, because that's, that's the title of the talk. Um, you kind of have to start viewing your events in terms of dependencies. So what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is we can take like a basic drag and drop, drag and drop example. Uh, so with drag and drop, you with, for each mouse down, and just if you were going to write it out like this, for each mouse down on your target, you start listening to mouse moves on the document until a single mouse up on the document. That's basic, basic drag and drop. You can implement it other ways. but um, So the first thing we can do is we can kind of look at this, and we can identify three different sets of events that we're going to have to compose together. Uh, I realize that this down here is kind of blending, and it looks white. That's, that's actually kind of, you know, I didn't make this accessible. I'm sorry, Ron. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's mouse downs on your target, there's mouse moves on the document, and there's mouse ups on the document. So those are our three different types of events we're going to compose together. So if we're going to get those events and get them ready, we, this is what we would do with Rx. And uh, what we're actually doing is we're setting up three observables. Uh, one, that we're actually taking the target from uh, the DOM, and we're setting up an event of mouse downs on that target, or a stream of events for, for that. We're also going to set up a stream of events on uh, document mouse move and one for document mouse up. Now, these are observables. And I want to remind everybody here that observables don't do anything until you subscribe to them. So I'm not actually setting up listeners at this point. I'm just setting up functions that are going to set up listeners later, basically. I'm setting up observables that we can subscribe to at some point. 
And then we look at what we're doing with our drag and drop. And uh, I'm going to focus on this, this uh, second part here where we're talking about mouse moves on the document until a single mouse up. So I'm going to kind of work my way backwards through uh, this functionality. So mouse movements on the document until a single mouse up looks like this. We've got document mouse moves, take them until a document mouse up. So it's just this observable, take those values until this other observable fires one time. So take the movements until you get a mouse up. But that's not all. We didn't want to start doing that until we have a mouse down on our target. So again, working backwards from our goal, we are going to basically say, OK, well, to, we're going to start with uh, target mouse downs. And we're going to switch map that, which is going to, it's going to flatten out our other observable of mouse movements. So we're going to say start as soon as, as soon as you do a mouse down on this target, Go ahead and start listening to mouse movements, but take them until you have a document mouse up. So if you uh, had some sort of superhuman ability to click the target twice without letting up on your mouse, um, this would behave very strangely. But this should work just fine for a drag and drop. So th just more on thinking reactively. So that in that last example, I kind of took what, uh, what I wanted to do. I examined what my uh, events, my kind of event dependencies were. Uh, made streams of those events and then composed them together, kind of working from, from the, the end of what I wanted towards, towards the beginning. Uh, if you want to think reactively, you can actually um, look at any variable in your imperative code that you have today. Uh, and you can, you can realize one thing. If, if you were to just put your finger on an, any variable in your system, any, any application you're working on, that, that variable is going to you're going to hit that line of code over time, right? It's going to, every now and then, something's going to happen in your system, and it's going to hit that line of code, and that variable will have a value. And then sometime later in the future, it's going to hit that line of code again, and that variable is going to have a value. So guess what? That variable can actually be represented by an observable. An observable is a collection of values as they happen over time. So. If I was to find any line of code in some system, let's say I've got uh, something here where I'm saying I'm going to take variable A and variable B, and I'm going to add them together, and then do something with, and, and stuff them in C, and then do something with C. If the, the, uh, the interesting thing about this is what, what we want to do is we want to call, we want to take A and B, and we want to we do something with C here. The, the thing is, um, if we want to have a stream of C, uh, it's going to look like this. So like I said, you can represent C as a stream. Uh, so if I want to do something with C and I had a stream of C, I would just call subscribe with do something. So I've kind of pulled that out. And then the next thing is we know that C comes from A and B. Like some event happened that changed A or changed B or maybe changed both of them. So we need to recalculate C. Uh, so what we'd, we'd do is eventually we'd figure out how to get a stream of A and B. and I'm, I would have to work my way back through that, but I, we don't know what that other code is. I've snipped it out. But once we have a stream of A and a stream of B, we can say we're going to take our stream of A and combine it with the latest value from the stream of B, and then actually call it and add those two things together, and then we get our stream of C. So what, what we're doing is we kind of start with the end and work our way backwards just by kind of creating streams. So if you're going to try to refactor your code into all observables, I don't recommend doing that. But you could. Uh, that's, that's kind of how you would get it doing that. All right, so the next thing I get, especially after talking like that, um, <laughs> oh my god, RxJS is so confusing. Um, one of the best things I can tell people that are just getting into Rx that are really, oh my god, this is so hard, it's really confusing, is just stop worrying about the operators. Uh, just worry about observable itself. I, I really mean it. Just don't worry about the operators yet, OK? Because <laughs> you, were, you were probably comfortable with promises. Most people here have used promises, seen them. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. If you're comfortable with promises, promises look like what you see here at the top, where it's promise then, and you've got a success function and an error function. Uh, observable isn't that much different. It says observable, subscribe instead of then. And you've got a next function and an error function. Um, but you've got this additional completion function there to tell you when the observable is done delivering values. Now, there is a semantic difference here. If you have a promise 
it's eager. It's already doing whatever it was that's going to deliver that value at some point. The observable isn't going to do anything until you subscribe to it. But overall, like readability wise, they look very similar. They look so similar, in fact, that if I point out the fact that most people really only use the first callback in promise then, uh, and again in, in observable subscribe, um, now all of a sudden it's the difference between the two of them is, is a little silly. I could, I could rename them if it helps. Uh, to quick draw McGraw and quick draw McDraw uh, with some callbacks, and I don't even remember which one's which anymore. But it's not like a really scary signature is kind of what I'm getting at. So if you if you forget about the operators for a minute, um, it's it's not as it's it's no scarier than a than a promise really. You can maybe get your feet with with map or filter. Most people have used map or filter on arrays. I, I would say start with those um, maybe if you feel comfortable. Uh, so. And then you could work your way up to, say, flat map and, and switch map and some of these other th more common ones as you, as you get more and more used to it. So th the next question that people uh, often ask is, oh my god, what, oper <laughs> what operator do I use? Uh, again, I ask this myself all the time. This is as you're getting more and more into it and you're getting past the map and, and flat map and filter. Just remain calm. Operator agony. There, there's a few, there's a few r routes to solving this. One is you can use the operator guide, uh, which you can find here at ReactiveX.io. It's kind of down at the bottom of the screen. I'll show a screenshot of that in just a minute. Um, basically, it asks you a series of questions to kind of guide you to the right operator to use. Um, the next is you, you, you don't, you can remember, you don't have to RX everything. If, if you get your, if you use your observable and you map and filter and to a point where you've kind of got it close to what you need, in order to get the job done, but you can't figure out what operator to use, you're just having a hard time, fine. Just subscribe to it at that point and use imperative code to get the rest of your job done. Um, you know, will you get some RX aficionado come by and snicker at your code? Maybe, but that person's a jerk. D don't, don't worry about that. You can tell them that I said that. Um, so the other, the other thing is you can just take, well, this is basically what I just said, just take the operators you know, um, to the, to the point at which you're comfortable and, and just use it imperatively. So the, the guide on ReactiveX.io, uh, if you go to ReactiveX.io slash RxJS, you can find it at the bottom. It's not, it doesn't really stand out, uh, but this is the, you go down here and you can answer this series of choose your own adventure type questions. It'll help guide you to the proper operator that you might be looking for. Uh, my recommendations, my personal recommendations for ones you can start with. Uh, I would start by kind of going and looking at the documentation for these, practice them in JSBin or whatever, map, filter, scan, merge map, switch map, combine latest, concat, and do. Um, these, are, these are ones that show up in almost everybody's uh, Rx app that, that I've seen. So that's, that's important. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from, from this particular topic real quick. I want to demystify observables a little bit. Uh, so a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people look at an observable and it's this async type and it seems really advanced and they're like, what is this? Uh, you know, what's what's happening here? Dark magic, unicorns? We don't know. Is it? Is there some sort of crazy logic that happens inside this observable type? Um, no, not really. Uh, an observable is really nothing but a function, and I'm going to set out to prove that. Um, so if you have a function that takes an observer. And an observer, just so you know, is a plain object that uh, has a next method on it, an error method on it, and a complete method on it. So you could pass anything like that in here. And uh, inside of it, 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 calls, it calls some methods on it. So what you'll see is uh, I'm calling next and complete on my observer in here. I'm setting up an interval. And then every time my interval ticks along, I'm going to call next. And I'm saying, oh, if my interval ticks 10 times, then I'm going to call complete. So that's. That's all that this particular function is really doing. And then the other thing that this function does is it returns some teardown logic. In this case, I'm going to return a function that calls clear interval. That it, so when I, when I call this function, um, you, can, you can call this function with your own observer. See, it's just a plain object down there at the bottom with the next error and complete method. I'm using console log there. Um, that's, how you sub, that's how you would subscribe to it. If, if observable was just a function, you would just call it by subscribing to it and you give it an observer, and then it executes this logic up here. Um, 
So just to, just to highlight that again, there's the observer that you're passing in, and that's where it's going into your function up there at the top. That's what's actually being called. So if you want to if you want to unsubscribe from it, we like I said, you're returning um, this this teardown logic here at the, it's at the bottom where I've got my clear interval. I'm going to return that, and at some time later, I can call that to actually tear it down and stop my interval from ticking along. This is an observable. This is all an observable is. Uh, when you when you build it or when you use it inside the observable, this is all it's really doing. So an operator, when people think of operators like map and filter, uh, an operator is really just a function that takes an observable and returns an observable. So, and we know that an observable is just a function that takes an observer. So if I was going to factor this out into that, And what we do is we, we actually take the source observable and we subscribe to it in some way and we return a brand new observable. So that's, that's all an operator is, is, it, is it's setting up kind of a chain of observers. So what you do to set up this chain of observers is you then, once you, once you subscribe to it with your own observer, you actually pass values from your own observer into the observer you're provided in the, in, to, in the observable you're returning. So just to, just to rehash, you're passing in this observable, and you're returning a new observable, which is this whole function here, that when called, subscribes to the source observable. And you subscribe to it with your own observer that you're then closing over the provided observer with so you can forward values along. That's, this is what an operator does internally. So there's our observer that we're, we're going to pass things along to. And if we wanted to make this a map operator, all we do to make this a map operator is we'd provide a mapping function. And we'd actually call the mapping function before we forward it along to our, uh, our destination observer. So let's use this mapping, this mapping operator on our observable function that we created earlier. If, if, if everything were functions, this is, why, this, is, this is what it would look like. So we've got map. Uh, we're calling it on my observable up here. And then um, when we execute this, we can see we're, we're actually mapping it to have uh, like an exclamation point added to the end. So if we, if we call this, uh, we're actually going to log out um, you know, 0 exclamation point, 1 exclamation point. Like this, this actually works. With our, our mapping function that we built here executed just does this. So it's not too bad. Uh, we could have an Rx that worked this way. So what happens if we uh, what happens if we chain a few of these? So we chain a couple. We got map, and then we've got another call to map inside of that. Eh, it's not too great. And if we run it, we can see okay, awesome. It's adding an exclamation point and now a question mark because our second map uh, mapping function was adding a question mark. Not too bad, but. You know, it gets really gross when you have a lot of operators. So you've got a map and a filter and a scan and all these other things in there. It's not looking too hot now. It's, there's two maps and a filter, and you're kind of building things out to the right. And really, the scan happens first, and then there's a filter, and then there's a map, and then there's another map. So it, it's, not, it's not very easy to read. Maybe we can format it, and that'll be better. Nope. It's still gross. We don't like that. So what do we do? What do we do to solve this problem? A nicer API would be if we could use dot chaining. Um, re really, uh, really important sort of concept here is dot chaining. And the, the way we get to having dot chaining is if we wrap our observable function in a class uh, so we can kind of use methods on that class to do this, this action, provide the, the, uh, the, the source would actually be the class itself. So what I've done here is um, I'm actually Providing the, the observable function itself, the, the function that we were just using as an observable, I'm going to provide it to this class, and I'm just going to stuff it on this, uh, on this class uh, member called observable function. Uh, and then down here, when I want to use it, I just call observable function on, on my observable. Like I basically pass the same sort of function to new observable, and then I call observable function. But that's not really a great name. We could just change it to subscribe. So this, basic, this is a really basic implementation of, a, of an observable. This isn't exactly Rx's implementation. We provide a lot of other guarantees for you. But this is sort of what an observable is doing under the hood. 
So now we can add map operators. We can literally just take the same map operator we had before, and instead of also passing a source observable into it, we just use this, because this is our, our instance that we're, that we're dealing with. And that means we can chain them now. We can say, I'll create a new observable with, and then just call map, 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 and uh, subscribe to them. We have a much easier, easier to read uh, bit of code. So if, if you've ever wondered why observable is a class, um, if it's doing something lazy like this, it's, it's a class to enable dot chaining and a lot of other safety mechanisms that, uh, that you might enjoy in, in, um, in observable. So dot chaining, uh, the ability to add safety to the type. The, the safety to the type is the sort of things like um, the observer we are provided, you're not allowed to next into it after it completes, and so on. Uh, there's some performance optimizations we can do in there for sure. Uh, things to come to mind are things like if you have an observable that's scalar, which would be a synchronous observable of one value, uh, RxJS 5 will do things like pull the value directly out of the class itself without having to subscribe to it so it can execute things a little bit more quickly. Um, but the important thing to remember is it's really just a function. Observables are just a function. If someone hands you an observable, it is not doing anything until you subscribe to it. Even if it's a hot observable, uh, it, the hot stuff is happening outside of the observable. The observable itself is a function that connects your observer to some, something that's providing values. So the big takeaway is think of them as functions. That's all they are. Uh, the, the other term that you hear sometimes is that observables are lazy. Uh, they don't do anything until to, to they're called. And operators take your observable, and they return, return a new observable. So going again back to that original function I showed you that was taking the observable, returning a new observable, which we then changed into a function that took an observer. Uh, the other kind of important thing I want you to notice when you're looking at operators is uh, right here. So if operators, operators return a function, and this, this function, what it does, what it really does when you call it, is it builds an observer and wraps another observer in it. So every operator you add in your observable chain, are actually, they're actually chaining a whole bunch of um, observers together. So you're, you're setting up some data source over here, and then map, filter, scan, you know, flat map, and so on. Every single one of these things just chains a whole bunch of observers together. Um, and I've got a visualization uh, for, of this uh, here. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at what's happening here. So if it's chaining all these together, uh, what we actually have is we've got an observer at the very head, which is our safe observer. That's the thing that provides you some guarantees, like you can't next if you've already completed and, stu and such, which pushes values at the filter observer, which, when the filter passes, pushes values at the map observer, which transforms those values and pushes them at your observer that you're providing it. Now, this down here is a function, but what subscribe actually does is scrub the function into an observer that can be chained to the previous, the, to the, the previous one in your, your operation. So the visualization looks a, a lot like this. Um, what you have is these things here are your actual observers. If you're going to at, look at them, and each one of these uh, swim lanes you see here are actually like your next channel, your air channel, and your completion channel. So you've got one for your producer at the head, uh, one for your filter operator, one for your map operator, and the tail that wraps your handlers, just to clarify what all these rectangles are on the screen. And what's, what this actually looks like, if you're going to visualize it, is here I've got an interval. And the first value interval produces is 0, and then 1, and then so on. So the first value it produces is a 0. It's going to send that via its observer on the next channel to the filter. The filter observer is going to look at that and, and say, oh, well, 0 actually passes um, my assertion, so I'm going to forward that along to map. Map says, OK, well, I can add two zeros together and get 0. I'm going to do, do so, and I'm going to forward that along to my, uh, sub my subscriber, my next handler, which has been wrapped in an observer. And it's going to do whatever it's going to do, if it's going to log out or whatever it's, whatever it's doing. The next time you come through, it's going to send along a 1. So in this case, just to show what filter is going to do, um, One's not going to pass this assertion. It's, it's, uh, it's checking for even numbers only, this, this assertion and filter. So it's actually going to stop 
at that observer. That observer is not going to forward that value along. So that's 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 all there. That's all there is really to how this works in basic. But what about error handling? There there are a few things that uh, that are that around error handling and how this works that get a little tricky for people. So the the safety guarantees I've already mentioned a few times is observers will no longer pass along values if error is called or complete is called or someone's unsubscribed, right? You wouldn't want someone to unsubscribe and you're like, ha ah, fooled you, I got to give you a value anyways, right? Like that's, that's, not, that's not okay. So, but the, the error part confuses some people because some people think, oh, I'll get an error and then I'll get the next value after that error. It's just telling me there's an error, it's gonna keep going. No, that's, that's not what happens. It actually kills that observer. Um, so to kind of go what, uh, through what this uh, looks like, I'm, I've set up this contrived example here where I've got the interval again. And I'm saying if, if uh, our value is 1, which should be the second value through that, we're going to throw an error, and we're going to see what happens. So first, we're going to send along 0. That's going to go fine into our uh, mapping function. Our mapping function is going to go ahead and map that, which it's just mapping it to itself. It's going to send along that 0. And that makes to our subscriber. But the second time it's going to send the one, the one is actually going to throw an error. So when it errors, what's going to happen is this whole observer can no longer next complete or error ever again, which means it's inert. It can't do anything. So that effectively means that everything up above it is now gone. It, it can't possibly send anything from that source, that interval ever again, because it's, it's turned off effectively. It will, of course, take the error signal and send it along to the next destination. But after that, it's totally done. Uh, we're going to handle our error and our subscriber, or whatever we're going to do. So what we have is we have the catch operator. And the catch operator actually works a lot like uh, how catch works with promises. Um, it just takes a function that gives you the, an error and it expects you to return an, a new observable, whether that observable is in error or uh, successful or just completes, whatever that might, may be. So uh, in this example here at the bottom, what I've got is I'm actually sending along another value. So you've got this, you've got some error, and they're like, no, this is fine. Go ahead and send it along. So using catch. So this time, I've just got an observable of the value of 1. I'm just going to send that along. In this map operation, this developer is really a sadist. He's like, no, I hate 1s. Like any value you send me, it's just going to complain that it hates 1s. Uh, and then I'm going to actually catch that and send along a, uh, an observable of 2. So first I send along the 1. Uh, there's, we get our error. Our error kills everything up above that. And then what's going to happen is catch says, oh, I got hit in the error channel. We send along the error channel hits the catch observer. And that means technically that catch's observer is dead too, because I told you any observer that gets hit with an error is done. But what catch does is it's going to actually map this to a new observable of 2. So we'll bring that in, and we'll subscribe to it. And it forwards along an observable of 2, which hits our subscriber. And then, of course, it completes after that, because it's just an observable of the value 2. And we're done. So, but catch still let our whole observable die. And that's where some people get confused. If they have some interval and they've got a catch somewhere after their interval and they, oh, well, I caught it. Why is my interval not going still? So what you, what you want to do is you want to isolate your observer chains. And what do I mean by that? So here's the example of the interval we don't want to die. So this is some sort of long polling scenario where every, what is it, 10 seconds, I'm saying get something um, from some URL and I'm actually... I don't want this to die. And this is what people usually do in their first attempt. They're like, OK, well, I've got an interval. I'm using switch map to uh, make this request every time this interval ticks along. And then I don't, if that fails for some reason, I, I want to make sure that my stuff keeps going. So they add a catch right afterwards. Looks nice and neat. Everything's in a row. They're happy. Uh, and they're, but they're like, they're like catch and ignore. They're just saying, if, if I catch this, just observable, empty, and we're fine. Um, a few of them, you might already see what's coming here. But let's just say we, we send along a 0. Uh, we actually get into our switch map. And the switch map creates a brand new AJAX observable that we're going to subscribe to. And it's going to subscribe to it in such a way that it pumps the values back into our switch map handler in, in a roundabout way. And uh, what's going what's to happen in this case is we're going to say, 
it's going to merge the values back in. Um, and the, we'll, we'll say the first call is successful. This first call is successful. Catch just passes through the value. Uh, if, it, if it comes on the next channel, it's not going to do anything with it. It's catch. It doesn't care about successes. It only cares about errors. And it gets along to our subscriber, and it's done. But now we're going to send along one. So 10 seconds later, this thing fires, and we get a brand new AJAX observable. And this time, we're going to say that it errors. So it, it fires along the error channel there into our switch map. That means that both of those observers are dead, because I've, I've, hit, I've called error on both of them, uh, which basically means everything up above that is dead. I can't send anything through that again. It goes along to my catch. Catch actually maps the error into a brand new observable of empty. Empty just completes, because it doesn't have any values, and we're done. So I've killed my long polling. That's not what I wanted. This is the, oh my god, Ben, this is so, RX is so hard, this is crazy. So everything dies, lol dead. Let's, uh, we, wanted, we wanted to keep that interval going. So let's, let's keep the interval going. What if we moved the catch inside of the switch map? So you, you saw when I, when I had that switch map how it kind of moved the, like a little observer up outside of my main observable, uh, or my main observer chain there. That's what we kind of want to do. So let's, let's try this out. Our interval, our, inter, our interval, why can't I say interval? Our interval fires. Um, and then we, we hit our switch map. And our switch map creates the AJAX observable, this time with a catch. So now we've got a secondary chain. We've isolated this observer chain. And uh, what we're going to do is it's going to send along an error. We're just going to jump to the error part, because it's the fun part anyways. Error goes, kills that AJAX observable, which is fine. It was only going to give us one value if it succeeded anyways. And then catch dies, because we called error on catch. And it actually it doesn't do anything, because when catch dies, um, it's going to end up mapping it to a brand new empty observable, because that's what I, I had it inside there. And that's just going to forward along a, a completion. Now, the semantics of switch map are that if its source observable isn't complete, it doesn't care if the child that it created completes. It's going to keep listening to that source to make sure it's not done yet. So it just is going to swallow it. So the next time around, the inter interval fires. Uh, switch map creates a new AJAX observable. Both, both of them come in. You get the idea. Like it's, it's the, the interval did not die. And it didn't die because I took the part that could die and moved it off my main observer chain. So when you're, when you're building observable chains out, you're going to want to think about, um, you're going to want to think about, basically, you're building a chain of observers. All right. So we created a second observer chain. We punctuated the chain with a catch. And that actually ends up shielding the main observer chain. That, that catch is a very important part of that. You saw the first time it didn't have the catch, and it pumped the air down in the main observer chain, and that will definitely kill everything. So. Uh, TLDR, when handling errors, you probably want to add a catch inside of some sort of merge operation. It can cat map, a switch map, that sort of thing.